Thank you, thank you very much. And don't forget, this video was made possible by my patrons on Patreon. Want to support me? The link is on the screen. Sincerely yours, Visual Pony, and enjoy this audiobook. The Luna Cipher Chapter 21 Friends When my mother opened the door, it was with a certain weariness. The neighborhood that my parents lived in was very respectable and very safe, but I imagined that the noise Discord and I had made was something that had never been heard in that quarter of the city in several lifetimes, if ever. It's okay, ma'am. I reassured her. It's me. Can I come in? She peered over my shoulder at the slowly rising Draconicus and then looked back at me. Dear, are you okay? Nope, not really. Hey, you've never met Discord, have you? Mom, this is my friend, Discord. Malevolent spirit of disharmony and inappropriate touching. Discord, this is my mother, Twilight Velvet. Help me. Discord wheezed. Call the guards. Celestia, any pony? I laughed at that. Maybe I laughed a bit too much. Oh, don't worry about him. Those are specially concentrating shields to nullify his magic. They've got to be that layered and tied to work properly. They're not uncomfortable on purpose. I happened to notice the effect of my ordinary shield on his magic and then worked up the specialized version just in case someone got a little too playful. Be prepared, that's my motto. I thought about what I just said for a second. Well, I guess that's one of my mottos. A reading is magic is another. Oh, and keep detailed notes is a good one. Maybe I should start a list. Mom gave me a look. Oh, right, sorry, I got sidetracked there for a second. Busy day. Can I park Discord out here in the hall while we visit? I was feeling a bit giddy and jumpy at the same time. I supposed it was the effort of maintaining the multiple shields, but I thought I could probably hold them indefinitely by adding little bursts of power at measured intervals. Plenty of time for a nice chat with mom and dad and a rummage through my old textbooks. That isn't funny anymore. Quiet, you! I propped him in the corner by the head rack, facing the wall, and then gave my mom a big hug, which we held for a long time. I'm so glad you're okay, dear, my mom said. A captain from the guard arrived last evening and told us you'd come back, but he also mentioned that you had... changed. She held me out and looked at me. You look like you've been exercising quite a lot, but otherwise you don't look like you've changed much. Right, right. I chuckled nervously. I guess you haven't heard about the little frackers in Parliament Square yet. All smoke and mirrors, nothing to worry about. All right, dear, my mom said slowly. Why don't you come in and sit down? You look a bit frazzled. She led me into the parlor and I sat down on the big blue cushion by the fireplace. Have you got anything to eat? I haven't had breakfast yet and I'm starving. Of course, dear. My mother said with a worried, puzzled look still on her face. Just wait here for a minute. She went out of the room in the direction of the kitchen. Okie dokie! Oh, hey! I'm going to have a look through some of my old books if that's okay with you. They're still up in the attic, right? You didn't sell them or anything? Mom leaned back into the room and gave me another look. She's got a whole vocabulary of expressions for various occasions. Of course, she wouldn't have sold my books. What was I thinking? I teleported the books I wanted into the room. I'd brought only the books and not the boxes. The boxes were probably covered with dust and mom was a bit fussy about the neatness and cleanliness of her house. See, I can be very thoughtful sometimes. At least with little things. A low conversation started up out in the hall, but I ignored it. I opened Advanced Geomancy, High Order Somatic Flow Functions and Matrix Transformation Theory and began to go through them, cross-referencing and making notes in the margins. After a little while, there came a voice from the hall. 
Twilight? I looked up to see my dad peering into the room. I froze my books, notes and quill in place and got to him to hug him. He seemed tense for some reason. Oh hey, where are my manners? Have you met Discord? Let me introduce you. No, it's fine, sweetie. I just had a little talk with him. Maybe you should let him go now? What? No! He's been bad and is having a timeout. Besides, he would turn your house into a gigantic pudding or something if I let him loose. It would get all over my books. Okay, Dad said gently. What is it you're doing there? Well, I said, clearing my throat and putting on my serious business face. The world is all twisted inside, the government of Equestria is based on lies and deception and I'm a cold-hearted killer. There's not much I can do about that last one, but I'm going to do my best to fix the first two. Maybe you'd like to take a little nap now and talk things over later? Dad, I'm not a little filly anymore. I know what I'm doing. Sweetie, you're not thinking clearly. You're upset, and even though you've got very good reasons to be so, you need to take some time to... Look at this! I said, my voice rising unintentionally. I held up the geomancy book for him to see where I'd circled a formula in red ink. Right there! That is a deliberate error! It was put in this book to distract any pony away from getting near the real truth! Uh, sweetie... Don't sweetie me, Dad! It's a monstrous lie! It's part of a conspiracy to keep us all ignorant! Twilight, you're scaring me. You should be scared! I've seen what lies at the heart of the world and it is worse than any nightmare! And what's so awful is that Celestia is hardly better! There has got to be a way to fix all of this! Our little puppet show this morning is only a patch. The system is fundamentally flawed. Mom shoved Dad aside and slowly approached me. Twilight, listen to me, please. Take a deep breath and try to calm down. I've made some sandwiches and tea, so why don't we sit down together and eat? And you can explain all this to us bit by bit, so that we can understand. Don't patronize me! I shrieked. I'm right! I shook the textbook at her. If this stupid formula is correct, would I be able to do this? I turned to the window overlooking the street and reached out with my magic. My inner sight showed the subtle flows of energy below the pavement and I grabbed onto them, intending to twist a big granite spire up into the sky to illustrate my point. Just because the somic flow of the world's magic is slow, doesn't mean it's weak. Something that I had disregarded in my haste to prove my point. Something else I hadn't taken into consideration was that, even though I had expelled the nightmare's physical self, I still had her magical power within me. So even before I could begin the spell, I unintentionally created a conduit of enormous capacity. I had a fraction of a second to realize my mistake before the blowback bucked me into darkness. When I woke up, I was tucked into the guest bed. Dad was sitting by my bedside. He looked up when I shifted, and then stood and leaned over me. Hey, sweetie, how are you feeling? Okay, I guess. Kinda numb. We were pretty worried for a while there. He arced over and smoothed my mane back from my face. The whole little episode came back to me in a rush, and I tried to sit up suddenly. My head swam and I decided it was better to be lying down. I looked at my dad and said, Discord, what happened when I passed out? Did he... Dad looked a bit uncomfortable and pointed with a hoof. There, between my forelegs, was a little stuffed toy. It looked a lot like Discord. One of its button eyes winked at me. Ah! I flung the doll away from me and it hit the wall with a squeak then dropped to the floor. Discord arose from the floor and dusted himself off. I was just trying to comfort a friend, Twilight. Where's the harm in that? I eyed him warily, all too aware of the things he could do to me if I was slow to cast my special shield spells. Even if I got the jump on him, my parents' house would suffer in the struggle. One. I... I guess you're pretty mad at me, aren't you? One. 
The slide and swing set in the park would never be the same. Maybe they could be passed off as some sort of modern art installation. Oddly enough, I'm not, he said. I wouldn't want to become predictable. I'm really sorry if that makes a difference. Discord floated up over the bed and lazily looped through the air in a sinuous figure eight. I know you are, Twilight. You're completely predictable. Uninteresting and dull, a classic good girl. Boring. Dad was frowning at Discord and I think he was about to say something in my defense, but I made a little motion with one hoof to forestall him. Discord was working up to something. He wasn't as unpredictable as he thought he was. Predictable, am I? So what am I going to do next? I asked. You'll stay here, of course, away from those nasty, bickering alicorns and those horribly hot conversations. He said with a grin, a snap of his fingers and a burst of magic. Here, with your books, where it's safe and comfy. The sides of my bed grew rails and bars and I... I spat out the pacifier and teleported the baby bonnet and diapers off of me. Oh. Discord sounded disappointed. Would you prefer a padded cell? I flickered a brief shield around the bed, which returned it to normal and then I hopped out. I've got to go, Dad. I'm sorry for worrying you and Mom. She went for a doctor. He said not to, but... Tell her I'm okay and give her my love when she gets back. I'll let you know how everything turns out. I gave him a big hug and then turned to Discord. I'm going to the palace and I'd really appreciate it if you didn't stick your R in. Things are bad enough as it is. Discord hastily hit the R that had popped into existence behind his back. As long as you promise to tell me all about it afterward. Fine. I sighed. All the gruesome details, I guess. And hey. I reached over and pulled him into a brief hug. Thank you. You were a good friend to me even when I was being difficult. That's pretty impressive. I... Oh, you're welcome, Twilight. Was Discord actually blushing? It was undoubtedly just another act. I teleported into the entrance hall of the throne room. The two household guards that stood at either side of the inner doors didn't flinch, even though I had appeared quite close to them. Your Highness? One of them said. Her Majesty asked us to convey her regards and ask you if you would be so kind as to spare her a little time as soon as would be convenient for you. He had obviously memorized the message and was repeating it in verbatim. I imagined all of the palace guard had been given the same instructions in case I happened to wander by. I didn't have the heart to ask him which Majesty had given him the message, but as he was wearing the golden armor of the Solar Guard, it was undoubtedly his princess. Thank you, I said. Where is Her Majesty now? She's in the Solarium with the princesses Luna and Cadenza, Your Highness. So formal and serious. Well, after near hostilities for months on end, I suppose it was almost reflexive to be excruciatingly polite. The fact that they were talking to a mayor who had violently thrown around several hundred tons of Cantalot building materials just that morning was probably additional incentive. I thanked them again and headed up the north hallway. I was attacked as I passed the entrance to the staff dining room. The first pony hit me low and hard on my left, and just as I was turning to see what was going on, the next landed on my back. The others piled on only a second later, and I was buried under a heavy squirming pile of my friends. Twilight, 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 Twilight! Finky! I tried to say through a face full of fluffy pink mane. All coherency dissolved into overlapping greetings and joyful noises. I couldn't see Spike, but I knew the feel of his head spines digging into my cheek very well. After a while, we all fell apart and got a good look at the whole group. Did you come all the way here to see me? I would have come back to Ponyville in a day or so. Applejack stepped forward. 
After what Ramble Dash told us, we figured you might need a little looking after, so we caught the red eye last night. Yes, Rarity said. And we arrived just in time to catch the flashes and banks from Parliament Square. By the time we got there, it was all over and ponies were saying the most ridiculous things. Rainbow Dash gave me a crooked grin. Nightmare Twilight? Really? I almost rolled my eyes and scoffed, but then I thought about it. Not in the way ponies probably told it, but yes, today I was a villain. <laughs> yeah, right. Rainbow Dash did roll her eyes. But you're not dark and spooky anymore, Pinky said. So no my nightmare means you're our old Twilight again. I didn't think I was ever going to be their old Twilight again, but at least I could take a shot at being a new Twilight. The first thing I was going to do was ignore just how wet my neck was. I ruffled Spike's spines and said, I'm sorry I caused all of you so much trouble. I'm supposed to be the princess of bringing ponies together, not princess of crazy and pointless adventures. Zed got a chuckle out of most of them, but Pinky's eyes went slightly out of focus and she got a crooked little grin on her face that sent a little shiver up my spine. All that matters is that you're here and everything is back to normal, Fluttershy said with an expression of desperate hopefulness. Normal, I said. Right. Oh, hey, Rainbow Dash said and pulled something out from under one wing. You made the papers, check it out. Evil Defeated, read the headline. By slightly less evil, I mentally added in self-disgust. Below the enormous letters was a full-width picture of me blasting the statue of Celestia. The photographers must have been in the square even before I'd arrived. Nothing had been left to chance. When asked for a comment, I said in an attempt at levity. Nightmare Twilight said, The evening shall last forever! The group began to chuckle but stopped abruptly when Spike slapped me hard on the shoulder. Stop it! He shouted. It isn't funny. You were gone for so long and then you came back looking like that. And I thought you were going to be get banished and I'd never see you again. And it isn't fair that you scared me like that and... I wrapped my wings around him and squeezed, rubbing my cheek against his. I'm sorry, Spike. I'm really, really sorry. I messed up, I know. But that was the only way I could fix things. It was the only way that more ponies weren't going to get hurt because of me. We hugged in an awkward silence for a time, while the girls shuffled their hoofs and examined the ceiling, and then I said, I know it isn't going to make up for everything I've put you through, but just as an initial apology, how about if I commissioned Pinkie Pie to bake you a double-stuffed, triple-layered gem cake for dessert tonight? R really Spike looked up, eyes shining. I nodded. Do you think you're up to the challenge, Pinky? Pinkie Pie's face tightened down into fierce determination. If he doesn't gobble enough to make himself sick, I'll turn in my oven mitts. With that, she turned and began to stomp off in the direction of the palace kitchens. After three stomps, she looked back over her shoulder and added, And there's gonna be so many gems in it, his bath is going to glitter. Something to look forward to. I told myself, while the rest of the girls made various quiet noises of disgust. On that charming note, Rarity said, as we have now have a de facto dinner date for us all, I feel I should pass along Princess Celestia's message. Oh, right, I said. The gods gave it to me. I was on my way to see her when you all ambushed me. Oh, well, don't let us keep you from your royal duties, darling. Too late. Dash sat, half under her breath, earning herself a perfunctory glare from rarity. All right then, dinner in the little hall an hour after sundown. I hesitated. Is it okay if I invite one or two more guests? We can have a little more private get-together back home in a day or so. Yes? Good? Rarity, could you please ask the castle staff to arrange the meal? Pass it along as a request from me. I nudged Spike. Walk along with me. You don't know how much I missed having my number one assistant by my side. Spike gave me a slight grin. You were probably lost without me. Utterly lost. 
I confirmed as we walked on towards the solarium. Ready to write out some invitations? He hesitated until I teleported a pad of paper and a quill into his claws. Ready. Good. I nodded and began to dictate. Her Exalted Highness, Twilight Sparkle, Princess of Friendship, announced the guard as he opens the door to the solarium. Exalted? When did I get a promotion? See you at dinner, Spike, I said as I walked away from him and towards the doorway. I had put on my big girl shoes and had mentally prepared myself for a stern dressing down from Celestia. I was determined to be calm and reasonable about it, and I was going to do my best not to get emotional. But I certainly wasn't prepared for what I saw when I entered the solarium. Luna and Cadence stood together with somber expressions. Behind them, almost entirely hidden from view, stood Celestia, looking out of the large windows. It wasn't until the door boomed shut behind me that she stood and turned to face the room. When I saw her tear-streaked face, I found myself frozen in shock. I didn't have much time to gawp, because Luna rushed forward and wrapped her forelegs around me and pulled me into a powerful hug. Oh, Twilight, I was so worried. She murmured into my mane. You should never have had to go through all of that. Celestia asked too much of you, expected too much. Despite her appearance, Celestia's voice was calm and even. Twilight is stronger than you give her credit for. She has her little eccentricities and moments, we used to call them, but she has always served the kingdom well. I felt Luna's lips against my neck as they pulled back in a snarl. She lifted her head to glare at her sister and opened her mouth, and suddenly her expression softened as her muscles relaxed. Celestia's own face went from neutral and distant to a fond smile. I felt a cool sensation of relief wash over me, and I breathed a sigh of relief. We all had the same basic values and goals, and we loved each other. Why should we fight? Everything would be fine. Celestia approached the two of us, and Cadence joined her, her horn softly glowing and shedding little heart-shaped pulses of magic. They both pressed in on either side of us, necks bowed over our backs and wings spread and overlapping. With all the wings and pointy bits, Elicorn group hugs are a bit complex, but we managed. There was a long time of unfocused apologies and reassurances after we had all dried our eyes, but there were several things that had to be gotten through and we all knew it. First came Cadence's area of expertise. I don't want to make you angry, Twilight, but I think I really should. Yes, of course. I cut her off. I had expected this and was prepared for it. Things would have gone very differently if I had been sensible about this in the first place. I glanced at Luna, but she said nothing and her expression was unreadable. Cadence lit her horn and touched me with her magic. It felt good. Then Cadence gasped. What is it? Celestia asked, suddenly alert and staring at me intently. I couldn't help it. I tensed up. It's... odd, Cadence said. I'm surprised by the... well, it's hard to explain. The texture of Twilight's magic, maybe? It just feels strange to me. There was an easy answer to that. I'm still carrying the Nightmare's power. Don't worry, there's nothing of her left, just the energy and I've gotten full control of it. I tried to smile reassuringly at Cadence. It should feel odd. Cadence glanced at Luna, who remained stone-faced, then back at me. Yes, that's probably it. Sorry, I'll go on. After a minute or so, the cool touch of Cadence's magic faded and she sat back. Yes, you are truly in love with Luna. Luna's ragged exhalation was neither missed nor commented upon, and fortunately it was loud enough to cover my own sigh of relief. But, Cadence continued, you aren't physically attracted to her as you were before, that might cause some... It will be of no concern, Luna interrupted. 
She had been standing behind Cadence and Celestia, but she walked slowly around them to approach me, flowing from one form to another with each step. She didn't transform as quickly as a changeling, but her mastery of the art was very clear. In a dozen paces, she became a dozen different ponies, all male. I shall be whatever my lover finds comely, and in time she may even find mine own self desirable again. The final body she wore as she stopped in front of me was a particularly striking stallion version of herself, Ezreal mane and all. I... Cadence said in a voice so low it was nearly a whisper. Unless you enjoy being a stallion, I'm not so sure that's wise or healthy. I briefly had the strange twin emotion of admiring Luna's new form and feeling that I was being disloyal to her somehow. I was about to make a very rude comment on the state of any pony's mental health versus my own when Celestia spoke up. We discussed this earlier, I believe. Cadence backed away and Luna turned to face her sister. It is Twilight's decision to make. I will do as she wishes. Luna, it is unfair to settle Twilight with such a decision. You have a responsibility. I cleared my throat. Would you mind bringing me up to speed on this discussion? There may have been a bit of an edge creeping back into my voice. Celestia glanced at her sister and Cadence, but neither of them seemed over eager to help out. She sighed and walked back to the big curved windows, nodding to a cushion next to her as she lay on her own. I accepted her offer and Luna, still wearing her stallion form, lay down by my side. Cadence stood where she was, nervously shifting her hoofs. The situation is now much better than it was, Celestia began. Very much better than I had any right to expect, in fact. But that does not mean that Equestria and her allies are returned to perfect harmony. There will be a long period of time in which any small disturbance will be magnified out of all proportion. We must take care that the next year or so is inordinately peaceful and... Normal. Cadence snorted. It was a very soft, ladylike snort, but it was certainly a sign from the only neutral Alicorn in the room. The Alicorn of Love had expressed her opinion. I was a little bit glad that I had missed the earlier discussion. Oh, I said, glancing at Luna, whose face had settled into an impassive mask once again. And we aren't normal. You are perfectly normal, Cadence said, barely above a whisper. It was obviously untrue, but we all knew what she meant. Yes, Celestia nodded. I cannot be anything but happy for your mutual love, and I understand how much it means to you both, but many ponies will feel differently. Because we are both mares? I know that makes a difference to some of the older and more conservative ponies, but most ponies nowadays don't care. Or they feel that expressing such prejudiced objections would not be received well, Celestia added. But that is only a tiny part of the problem, and alone it would not be of much consequence. The real problem is that Luna and I are more symbols to our citizens than we are real ponies. I have never taken on a lover because I have always had to be the inviolate sun princess the supreme and solitary leader of Equestria. A husband would have lessened my authority and stature in the eyes of my subjects. Luna is only now being accepted as a princess with equal authority, years after her return. Any mate for her would be problematic. But given your tangled history over the last two years, continuing your relationship would be incredibly disruptive at the very least. I opened my mouth to object, but Celestia went on. Adding in the confusion of Luna sometimes appearing as a stallion would also confuse our ponies about her traditional and symbolic role. You correctly pointed out that the gender problem will only affect the older and more conservative ponies of the kingdom. But that is a very good description of the majority of nobles and ponies in position of power. What every pony needs right now is reassurance in the normalcy and stability of our rule. Please forgive me for being blunt, but there's only one thing that is more important to me than your happiness, and that is the good of the kingdom. Continuing your relationship will severely damage the harmony of Equestria. 
We all were silent for a very long time. I could be noble and supportive of the good of the realm. Or I could selfishly choose to gratify my own desires and bring harm to Equestria. At least, that was a choice as Celestia had framed it. I turned to Luna. Her face was closed and unreadable, but her eyes were very bright in the late afternoon sunlight. I kissed her on the cheek and said softly into her ear, Wait for me in the Tower of the Moon. I will come there right after sunset. She hesitated, but finally nodded and rose to her hoofs. She didn't teleport away. Instead, she backed into the shadow of a pillar and faded from sight in a strange swirl of magic. From the look on Celestia's face, Luna's method of departure was some sort of message. I stood and went to Cadence, hugging her tightly. Thank you for everything you've done for me, and I hope you can forgive me for how rude and troublesome I've been. Of course I do, but you are sure you want me to leave Twilight? I would like to help if I can. The little laugh whammy she had dropped on all of us earlier had undoubtedly diffused the tense situation, but I needed to finish the conversation with Celestia without any moderation clouding the debate. Thank you, but this is something that should be between Celestia and I alone. I will see you tomorrow if I can. When the door closed behind her, I returned to my cushion and lay down again. I killed a pony for you today. Yes, I know I didn't strike the blow myself, but without my cooperation it wouldn't have been possible. So I am as guilty as you are. I did it because you convinced me that it was the best interest of the kingdom and to the world at large. But no matter what logic tells me, I don't feel that it was right. In the matter of my relationship with Luna, I won't say that the issues you raised are insignificant and I agree the image you both present is of critical importance. If you want a logical rebuttal from me, then consider Luna's likely reaction if I broke up with her. What sort of image would she present then, or do you think she is a good enough actress to cover up the resentment she couldn't help feeling, even if she was willing to try? Celestia listened attentively with a grave expression. She made no comment because she knew I wasn't finished. But I'm not going to get into a debate with you about this. This time, I'm going to go with what I feel is right. I'm not going to break it off with Luna. And what of Equestria? I smiled at her. I will be at the service of the kingdom in all public matters. As for private matters, I'm sure you have at least two or three excellent backup plans already figured out. Celestia looked a bit wistful, but not at all upset. You are an amazing pony, Twilight Sparkle and I cannot find it in my heart to deny you happiness. It will be as you wish." She stood and looked out of the big windows at the sun, which was nearing the horizon. I stood also, but didn't say anything, because I knew she wasn't finished. But, she said after a moment or so, if you would consider one thing, I would take it as a great kindness. Yep, I thought. Here it comes. My concern is for the image of the matter, yours is for the substance. We can both achieve our goals if you and Luna agree to keep your relationship a secret. Deception cuts both ways, I told myself. Author's Note Once again I must give my heartfelt thanks to my most excellent pre-readers, Academic Pony and Statues. Common time! I'm getting better at this, I think. Okay, first and foremost, I will remind you that you can support me via my Patreon. The link is in the description. Every dollar is needed, appreciated, and you know the rest. Sincerely yours. Well, not yet. The thing is ab about this chapter, it's kinda strange. First of all, we get Twilight, uh, yeah, knocking herself out, if I remember correctly? because she finds out that there are deliberate mistakes in her textbooks from when she was a filly. Also, there is that little thing with um, Discord being trapped in those shields, and uh, he is like, Help me call the guards, Celestia, any pony. 
Oh my god, Twilight. Oh my god. Okay, she has found a way to subdue the god of chaos. So, yeah. I can already see a particular Pegasus in the fandom uh, not liking this very much. Um, so, what do we see here? Uh, yeah, her father is, well, a little confused, I'd say, because, well, imagine you come home, and there is a Draconicus, uh, entrapped in several shield spells, standing to your head rack. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, also she snaps at her parents. I mean, what the fuck? Uh, no. No, Twilight. No. She, for, uh, you must imagine her, her, her parents have n no idea what she's talking about. I mean, she tries to explain, and even tries to show them, but oh my god. This didn't go well. Um, and then of course we have Discord actually being a supportive friend. I like that. I like that. I mean, he's trying to taunt her a little bit with that diaper thingy, but, uh, I mean, who can blame him? It's just a perfect opportunity for a little prank. And he's a prankster, basically. You, you know how, uh, I know Discord is based kind of off Q from Star Trek, but you know who he reminds me of? Uh, of Loki. The, the trickster. I really have to look into that. So, um, yeah. What can I say? I like this chapter. M most of it. Um, of course we have uh, the promise of a dinner party in the next chapter. Cadence uh, being actually the neutral one here in the whole Alicorn love singy discussion. And being supportive to por uh, towards the relationship with Twilight and Luna. That is cool. I like it. I like it. Seriously. And I can also understand, you know, let's break this down a little bit. I can understand Celestia's um, worries about the kingdom. I can understand it. But in this case, if any of the nobles acted up, I'd just say, fuck you. Seriously, because for her, I, I mentioned in my, one of my previous comment times, I think it was in the chapter where Twilight was captured, uh, that... Celestia is a pragmatist, and that is a, a character trait of her that irks me greatly. Because I'm one of those persons who says uh, the happiness of my family and friends are more important to me than what others think. You know, I'm, of, I'm seriously one of those persons when I wake up in the morning and go out for a smoke, um, I know... Some of my neighbors who also don't smoke in their house, they actually go take a shower and groom their hair and everything. You know what? When I go out, I just put on a pair of pants, uh, put on a t-shirt, and go out. I look like a homeless person when I go f for my first smoke, in the mo uh, first smoke in the morning. Seriously. Because I don't fucking care what other people think about me. First of all, most of my neighbors think I'm crazy anyway, so there's that. But, uh, yeah, what can I say here? I don't like that she is uh, urging Twilight to keep her relationship with Luna secret. It's just not right. I mean, of course, she has to consider the, uh, the well-being of Equestria and everything. But, you know, I just, you know, make a big announcement, go, really, call all the nobles together and say, here. This is, these are the facts, and if you don't like them, screw you. Seriously, that's what I'd do. And if they were the, then trying to uh, overthrow me, then I'd just, well, I wouldn't start a civil war, but I would go so far that I'd say, this is a fact, those two are together, you have to accept it, so they will, you know, perform their duties, but you have no say in their private lives. Their private lives are their private lives, and they do not concern you. That's what I'd do in Celestia's position. I'd call all the nobles together and do that. Because I'm that kind of person. Um, because that's a, that's a thing I always uh, dislike when I hear some private story about some celebrity or some, or another 
You know, what do I care if a celebrity uh, whose TV appearances I like, there was one of those uh, occurrences, I think, at the start of this year, or, or at the end of last year, I'm not quite sure anymore, because I don't care for such things. But, you know, my grandfather was uh, watching TV downstairs, and I looked up at the TV and saw, like, uh, yeah, that and that actor had cheated on his wife and was now leaving her, but she got, like, I don't know, five or six millions from his, um, from his money, and she didn't really cry after him. And I was like, why the fuck are you reporting this? It is of no concern if an actor, who is a really good one, um, goes and has a relationship with another woman, and then breaks up his relationship with his wife in mutual agreement, and even pays her 5 million or 6 million euros. That's not anyone's business. And that is why I strongly disagree with Celestia's stance on this. Because I don't care what people do in their uh, private lives, as long as they do their job right. You must imagine, I have personally been affected by such shit. I once worked in a retirement home that, that was run by the church. It was hell. I can tell you that much. It was fucking hell. First of all, I'm not a religious person. But I had to, you know, make a cross. Either I'm, um, Islamic, um, if, normal Christianity, what, I, I reformed something, I don't know the English word for it, or Catholic. And I'm like, uh, why is there no box for atheist? Because I'm not a religious person. So, I uh, made my little ex with the reformed Christianity thingy, because that's uh, with which I was baptized. And then there were other things, like they asking me for my sexual orientation. And I was like, what the fuck does that have to do with me doing my job? Seriously. And they only had two boxes there, homosexual or straight. So I was like, why do they want to know this? It is none of their business. And uh, there is even a law in place now that it is unrightful for uh, your f eventual future employer to ask you something like that. There is even stuff... I had other job interviews where I was asked, like, what do you do for a hobby? And back then, my greatest hobby was making music videos and uh, gaming and writing. And uh, I told them that, and they were like, okay, never heard of that shit. Because I was making um, music videos, you know, f taking a few scenes, an uh, anime music video, like taking a few scenes from uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion and uh, putting a song under that and cutting that all together and stuff. Yeah, so what? I like doing that. That was my hobby. But my hobby is has nothing to do with if I can do my job. I mean, uh, of course, if there is someone who has uh, gambling as a hobby, then of course that could be an influence on his job. Or drug abuse or stuff like that. Or drinking. But seriously, in some job interviews you are asked such ridiculous questions. Seriously, what is... It is none of their concern. It is none of their concern what I do in my, in my free time. It is not. Even so, uh, even it's not, it's none of their concern if I have, like, uh, if I'm married, if I am divorced. When I was uh, working there in this uh, retirement home run by, ch by a church, there was even a little box in the, uh, in the contract where I had to fill out if I was divorced or not. And I was like, what the fuck? I mean... Why? It is none of their concern, and it shouldn't be. I mean, some of you will now say, oh, but if you're working in a facility run by the church, then divorce should, could be against their image. 
Ha! Fuck you! I was in a reformed ch uh, church facility thingy. And <sighs> they aren't that strict. But I was still asked if I was divorced or not. So, yeah. Celestia stands on this. I do not agree with. The rest of the chapter was okay, and now I have ranted so much about unrelated matters that I think it's time for me to stop now and take a shower. Sincere yours, visual pony, we will uh, meet each other in the next chapter of this magnificent story, and there are only two chapters to go.